Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. And wonderful to see you all. I appreciate you. We're ready for another season of discipleship, believing God that he is going to help us. And uh, God is doing great things throughout the fellowship. Turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 22. The Medal of Honor is the highest military uh, award in America. It's given to those who have distinguished themselves by acts of valor. In other words, you can be in the military as a group in whatever branch, but there are decisions that people make personally that cause them to stand out. They have a, a picture I want them to put on the screen. During the Vietnam War, this man, John Philip Baca, uh, he heard the enemy firing on uh, his platoon and he rushed his team into battle through the enemy fire to try to help. A fragmentation grenade was thrown into the midst of the patrol and so Baca covered the grenade with his steel helmet and absorbed the, uh, the fragments and the concussion. They say that he directly saved eight men from certain uh, serious injury or death and so this is why he was given the Medal of Honor, standing out and making a difference. The text that we're going to read, we're actually going to read from two different passages. They have to do with a list of David's mighty men. And these were men that made impact in the kingdom, enabling David to fulfill God's will in his life and then transforming the nation. And so we're going to look at this and choose out some thoughts out of uh, one of the men here. And it talks about becoming mighty. And that's what I want to preach about. First Samuel 22, we'll start with verse 1 and 2. David therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And so everyone who was in distress in debt, and everyone who was discontented, they gathered to him. So he became captain over them, and there were about 400 men with him. In 2 Samuel 23, it uh, also has a part of this list, and we're going to read verse 20 through 22. Benaiah was the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man from Kabziel, who had done many deeds. He had killed two lion-like heroes of Moab. He also had gone down and killed a lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. And he killed an Egyptian, a spectacular man. The Egyptian had a spear in his hand, so he went down to him with a staff, wrested the spear out of the Egyptian's hand, and killed him with his own spear. These things Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, did, and he won a name among three Mighty men becoming mighty. I want to begin, I want to talk about the potential of a man. In our text, I began with the first mention of these mighty men in chapter 22 because it shows us men as they are. And how many of you know men as we are, we can have all kinds of problems. Verse 2 Everyone who is in distress, in debt, and discontented gathered to him. So these were men that gathered to David. And when you first look at them, you would not be impressed. They were men with problems. There are men here tonight that you feel what you are right now prevents you from having a good future. Maybe you think God can't help someone like me, that God can't use someone like me. I want to give you hope as we begin. What you are right now does not determine your future. Because the Bible tells us God is able to transform men. He is able to make them into completely different people. Chapter 22, here they are with all of their problems. 
but that is not how they stayed. 2 Samuel 23 that we read now tells about men transformed into a powerful fighting unit in the, the kingdom of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. The hope of the gospel is transformation. But I want to tell you something, the key to transformation is connecting yourself to a purpose. Purpose means the reason you exist. If you want to change, it is not just going to be by a positive mental attitude. It is not going to be enough to say, I must change. I need to be different. Must not drink. Must not do drugs. Must not lust. As though somehow that is going to help you. These men, they came with their problems, but they connected themselves to a purpose. They understood there is a reason that we are here on this earth. They heard that David had been chosen to become king, and they said, I want to be a part of what God is planning in our nation. There are men here, you may have problems right now. If you will connect yourself to what God is doing in a local church, what he is doing in a city, that is the process of how you can become transformed. Our text tells us the potential of a man. And that is this, your life can be larger than it is right now. They came to David because they had problems. Many of them were probably escaping Saul. They were escaping the consequences of their own foolish decisions. But they began to see we can be a part of something that is larger than us. It's huge. They began to understand their lives could make a difference because God was wanting to transform the nation. At the time of these first verses that we read, the nation under Saul's leadership, it was unrighteous. They were timid, but God wanted to make them holy and bold, a powerful force in the earth. They could be a part of that. God wanted to establish a testimony. He wanted there to be reference points for the whole earth. Psalm 96.3, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. Your life can make a difference. And they understood that their lives could be a part of something that lasts. Unfortunately, people today, they give themselves to things that will not last. They give themselves to Stuff that will soon be out of date and broken. They give themselves to fads that will be considered ridiculous if you just wait to a short amount of time. But this is thousands of years after this verse is written and we are still remembering the contribution that these men, they said, I want to be a part of something that lasts. And that is the potential of a man. This is the potential of what we call discipleship. A disciple is a learner. You could learn under the hand of God. You could be a part of changing people's lives and changing their eternal destiny. Mark 1, 17, Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. This is the power of discipleship. If you grasp, Jesus is saying to them, they're working their jobs. Fishing was their job. It was a career. It was, in some cases, the family business. But Jesus, one day, he gave them a vision. Your life can be bigger than fish. Your life can be bigger than, than a career or a job. It can be bigger than making money and buying stuff that doesn't last. You see, there are people that God intends for you to save. 
There are people that God has chosen that, that you will come in contact with them, whether that is by witnessing to them personally, whether that is by being in a band or drama, or some ministry that reaches uh, uh, the lost, uh, or whether that is uh, by pioneering a, a church someday or becoming a pastor. God has chosen people and he wants you to reach them. There are cities that God wants you to make impact on. When God first called me, I had no idea that God had in mind that I go to Launceston, Tasmania, Melbourne, and Victoria. Those are both in Australia. Johannesburg, in South Africa, in Prescott. I had no idea of that, but God knew your life can be larger. It can be a part of something bigger. You know what this verse tells me when I read this and now I look out here? I am in the company of mighty men right now. Look around you right now. Look at the people on either side. You are in the company of mighty men. Many of them don't know it yet. These men came wandering to a cave. I, I hope that the police don't catch me. But little did they know, little did they know when they wandered into that cave. Here's a guy, how come you're here? Man, they're after me. Yeah, I owed money, yeah, the, life stinks. But little did they know that as they gathered in the cave, they were in the company of mighty men, men who became different, men who became larger. If you will ask God to give you a vision for your life, if you catch sight of that, there is nothing more exciting in all the world than knowing that your life made a difference. You, gentlemen, you do not want to end your life and no one care. You don't want to end your life and say, I live for me but I didn't actually change anybody else's life. God wants you to be a part of something larger than you. Ronald Reagan, he was a famous Hollywood actor. Then he became the governor of California. Finally became the president of the United States. That is an incredible life. It was amazing. But Ronald Reagan, then he got Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's erases memory. If you read about his life, that by the end of his life, Ronald Reagan could not remember ever being an actor. He couldn't remember being a famous actor. He couldn't remember being the governor of California. He couldn't remember that he was the president of the United States. But there was one memory that stayed alive. In his office, there was a picture on his wall of the Rock River in Illinois. And when people would visit Ronald Reagan and they would ask him about that picture, he would brighten up and he would say, that's where I was a lifeguard when I was 17. Right there on that river is where I saved 77 lives. That was what was important to him. Gentlemen, let your life make a difference. Let's talk second about gathering to leadership. Our text shows us the importance of leadership. God who has plans for your life, he enables you to become what he has planned through a man of God. For Samuel 22, verse 2, they gathered to David and he became a captain over them. These men didn't just automatically just wake up one day and say, you know what, I am going to be different. David made the difference. It was when they joined David in the cave that everything began to change. This is the power of discipleship. If God has plans for your life, if he has a call on your life, 
It is a man of God that is going to help you to get there. Joshua, God told him, you are going to help divide the land for the people so they enter their inheritance. I have a plan. I have a planned out future for the people. They will get there because you're going to help them to get there. That's what discipleship is all about. Discipleship involves inspiration. Why did they go to David? Because David was the giant killer. He was, they knew this. When everybody else was playing and practicing soldiers, David came on the scene as a 17-year-old boy, saw that giant and said, why doesn't somebody take him out? I'll take him out. Fought him, hit him in the head with a rock, took his own sword, chopped off his head, and then held it up. That is why they gathered today. There was an inspiration. They said, I want to be like that guy. And that's the power of discipleship. You find a man of God and there's something good in his life. It inspires you to be a better man than you are right now. Discipleship involves direction. Our text says he was captain over them. This is speaking about direction. They came as a ragtag bunch of misfits, but David began to teach them how to be warriors. David was a fighter. He began to train them in how to fight. They learned this. This is what happens. Discipleship, a man of God can give you direction for your life and how to get where you need to be in God. Discipleship involves correction. You cannot be a mighty man if you can't receive a captain. And sometimes the captain doesn't give you a back rub and say, you can do it, you can do it. Sometimes he says, no. Discipleship involves impartation. 2 Kings 2.9, Elijah asked Elijah, what is it you want? What do you want more than anything? He said, I want a double portion of your spirit be on me. Impartation. He said, I want to know what motivates you. I want to love what you love. What is it that causes you to have a fire? My father had a fire for the things of God. A passion. And Elisha says, I want that. That is what you get. There there is something imparted that you learn to love what your pastor loves. It, It is an outlook. It literally is a way of looking at life. When you catch a spirit from your pastor, it is how he looks at life, how he looks at problems. They understood something about David when he saw a giant defying the people of God. There was something that rose up in David and he said, why isn't anybody fighting? This is unacceptable. I am not going to put up with that giant defying God. And when they said, we want that, I want to look at life like you do. How do you respond to problems? David was a fighter. That was his instinct. When life is, when you're going through hell, give it back to hell. This is what has to happen. You have to catch a spirit. All of this, David is going to be the captain. Our text says they gathered to David. It was their choice. No one made them. See, this is, Discipleship is not a sentence. The judge doesn't sentence you to five years in the discipleship pen. You have to choose it. They said, I want to go where David is. You have to choose to come near. They went where David was. There has to be something in you that you want to come near to a man of God. Some of you, you're going to have to get over your past You're going to have to get over past rejection. You had somebody hurt you who was an authority. 
You're going to have to cry out to God to be healed because you're going to have to come near. You have to draw near to a man of God. You have to choose to learn from a man of God. These men went into the cave and they learned how to fight. They learned how to be warriors. You know what discipleship is? I challenge you, look, if some of you have a red letter Bible where the words of Jesus are in red, go to your red letter Bible and look how much of Jesus' teaching was a response to a question. He didn't just say it's Tuesday. Uh, that means we need to talk about the Trinity. No, they ask questions. Why do the disciples of John fast? And we don't fast. Shall we call down fire and kill everyone when the outreach didn't go well? <laughs> questions. Why do they say Elijah has to come first? If you do not have hunger to ask, you're not going to grow. I see this again and again in disciples. Those who do not ask do not grow. But as the moment a man begins to be hungry enough to ask questions, I see God begin to do something in his life. You know, it's pride that keeps you from learning. Some men say, uh-uh, I'm not asking a question because I don't ever want to look the fool. So then you learn nothing. You'll stay right where you are. You have to choose to receive correction. It may be that sometimes what you are doing is not okay. Or you're not doing it the right way and you will receive a rebuke or a correction. You have to understand this. It is for your future. A man of God doesn't rebuke because he's having a bad day. It is for your future. He's shaping you. Psalm 141, verse 5. Let a righteous man strike me. That is a kindness. You know the problem with that verse? It doesn't feel like kindness. When you're called out, don't do that. You better never treat people like that again. doesn't like, why, thank you, pastor. Right now, your pastor might be on you about making sure the equipment is packed or did you bring the advertising those are details when it gets on you about that someday it's going to be people's lives you preach the gospel there you can make decisions you can hurt people if you don't do the right thing that is why your pastor drills in in correction But let me challenge pastors for a moment. You know, when I preach like I just did, there are pastors, they're going, yeah, give it to them. Ooh, yeah, give it to them. That's right, they need a man of God. Listen to me, every pastor. This passage is an awesome responsibility because discipleship means God places men in your hands, in your ministry. The lives of men are in your hands. Their families are in your hand. Their futures are in your hands. Let me tell every pastor, if God brings disciples in your church, you are here for them. They are not here for you. From time to time, we have pastors, they get this weird idea. I have disciples. Come mow my lawn. Wash my car. And that's discipleship. How dare you use a holy gift of God of a man's life for, to be a personal servant. That is not discipleship. Every pastor here, you know what this means? Yes, it's true that you are the captain, but let me... That's, that's a responsibility. That means every pastor, you need to be the best man of God that you can be. It means you need to set an example for your men. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul wrote, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Listen, if your men do what you do, what kind of church are you going to have? If they have your attitude, 
what kind of church you're going to have. Paul was confident. He said, you can follow my example. That's a responsibility. It means you need to invest in your men. Discipleship, making disciples, it takes time and work. It involves searching God's word for what disciples need. It means you create an atmosphere. You give opportunities for men to ask questions. When I am here in town every morning after prayer, I sit and drink coffee that I do not enjoy. I do not eat the food, but I take time because I am there to give men an opportunity to ask questions. And that is time consuming, but it's worth it. It means if you're a man of God, you have to correct men with wisdom. They're, the problem with some pastors is they don't like drama. It's a hassle. Sometime when you correct a man, he'll pout. Sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll accuse you. They'll, they'll go after you. There are some men, they just don't like drama. So there are things that you desperately need to confront. But they're a pastor, they won't do it. You are doing your men a disservice. All you're doing, you're like Eli, you're saving you. You're not saving them. But if you need to correct, do so with wisdom. Maybe it's not best to do it in front of everyone. And if you correct, correct with vision. I had my butt kicked by a pastor one time. It was not an enjoyable experience. But he asked me, he said, Greg, what are you going to do one day? You want to be a, this was, I was just playing in a band. He said, you want, you want to be a Bible study leader? We're going to put your name on the back. Do you want people to look at that and go, there's no way I'm going to go to that jerk's Bible study. See, he kicked my butt. What I did was stupid, but he pointed me with vision. There's a reason why you can't be a jerk. I was like, oh. It's a responsibility. David took this responsibility very serious. The Bible tells in later times he's on the run, Saul is chasing him. He's not able to be near anything familiar. He's wandering in the desert. He's just reminiscing out loud. He's like, oh man, remember the water in the well of Bethlehem? Oh man, if only I could have a drink from the well of Bethlehem. And three of his men, they risk their lives. The enemy were in control of the well at Bethlehem. They fought through. They put their lives on the line just to draw out some water and they brought it to David. And when he saw that, he didn't say, yes, now bring me something cool and fruity. No, no, no. He said, that's whole. He said, oh God, this is their blood. I will not drink that. Their lives are in my hands. That is an awesome responsibility. It is not a light thing when a man opens his heart to you. It's not a light thing when a man wants to follow your example. The story we read is a holy intersection. When a man of God who will do right meets the heart of men who want to do right, mighty things happen. These men changed the nation because of a man of God and men who wanted to be larger than they are right now in God's will. Let's talk about one final thought. I want to talk about private merit. Some men have wrong ideas about usefulness and destiny. 
Some men think destiny just involves time. I've been here the longest. So, so I, will, I, I, I should get a position. I, I've, been, I've been saved longer than that guy. They viewed discipleship as a ladder, right? Here, he's here, and then them, and then there's me, and then. Years ago in the church, my wife and I were discipled in near conference, or during conference, rather, we had uh, somebody from another church, a group of people came for fellowship, we're there fellowshipping. A guy came in and we're, you know, we're getting, uh, hey, how you doing, what's your name, where are you from? And the guy, he, he announced, he said, uh, where he's from, and he said, I'm the number two disciple. <laughs> it's a ladder. He probably figured as soon as the number one guy goes, it's, it's got to be me. That's not correct. Some men, they want to be given destiny. They want to be appointed to usefulness. Ahimeaz, he said, I want to run. Appoint me as runner. James and John, they got their mother to ask, can we sit on the right and on the left? They wanted Jesus to appoint them to be powerful. But our text shows us something. If you take the time to read in 2 Samuel 23, I think it's in Chronicles also records the list of mighty men. It shows us that doing something for God involves merit. Merit means to earn or deserve praise or a reward. If you read through there, I only chose Benaiah, but the Bible says that Abishai, here's another mighty man, he won a name and he was honored, so he attained to the three. That word attain, it literally means to arrive. So these mighty men, it wasn't David just picking, I like you, so you be mighty. No, it was based on what they did. That was part of it. It was based on the decisions that they made. See, there is an element of usefulness that must be earned. No one can give it to you. In fact, if you are given something without merit, without earning it, you're going to struggle. You probably will fail and you're either going to hurt yourself or you're going to hurt other people. The old saying is, you can't keep a fourth class man up and you can't keep a first class man down. See, here's the truth of the mighty men. In the course of life and in the battles of life, men find their level. If you read the whole chapter of 2 Samuel 23, it tells about levels. Mighty men, they're all part of the group. But there was the first three, and then after that it would tell another guy, he was mighty, he did, but not like the first three. You find your level in life. And it's not just you that finds it. Whatever you are, ultimately will become apparent to other people. Listen, Discipleship is first between you and God. Second, it involves a man of God. But the third thing about this list is at some point, what happens between you and God and you and a man, a man of God, everybody else is going to know it. You don't appoint yourselves. Acts 6.3, brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And they had no problem coming up with seven candidates. Everybody knew who had faith. Everybody knew who had wisdom. That's, that's how discipleship works. Over time, it becomes evident who is praying, who is witnessing, who's working with new people, who's helping. It, it becomes known. 
Our text that we read, I chose to single out Benaiah. Benaiah fought battles with his brothers, with his pastor. But the verses that we read about Benaiah are talking about battles that he fought by himself. He fought two men of Moab. He fought a lion in a pit on a snowy day. He fought an Egyptian. Those battles are talking about battles not just that he fought with his pastor David or with his bros. He fought them by himself. There was no one there helping him. You know what this tells me? Discipleship involves battles that you fight in private. And no one knows it. Initially, anyway. See, every man who wants to be used by God, you're going to fight unseen battles. There's going to be battles of discipline. The Bible records that Jesus fasted. He was disciplining his flesh. For some, that might be food. For others, that might be social media, entertainment, battles of discipline, battles of temptation. Luke 4, 1 and 2, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Yes, the devil will target you, and you have to win. Crucial moments in your life, you have to say no because it's going to determine your future. Privately seeking God in relationship. By all means, you want to be a man of God, you need to be in prayer before church. You can work it out, be in prayer in the mornings. Yes, that's great, but you need to seek God when there's no one else around. Seeking God in the Word, seeking God in prayer. You're going to have to contend for breakthroughs in your own life? Where is it that you struggle for dominion? Where is it that the devil always seems to win? There you must get a breakthrough and only you can do it. You're going to have to choose to have priority in money. I will not let money run my life. I will not let money take me away from the will of God. You have to choose in your marriage You cannot have destiny without a marriage, without a wife, ultimately. There's some of you, you are married, but you want to live like you're not. I can really have, I can do something for God. What's this woman? She always wants me to talk to her, pay attention to her. (sighs) You're a foolish man. Everything good I have in my life, I thank my wife for. But I also invest in that relationship. You're going to have to privately contend for a supernatural dimension. All those are private battles. You're not going to give a report each service. Pastor, this is how many hours I spent. It's between you and God. But if you will, there'll come a day everybody's going to know it. When I felt called of God, I began to study. I began to hunger for God's word. I was doing that privately. But whatever's fought in private becomes apparent. Luke 4, 14, he returned to Galilee in the power of the spirit. This is after the fasting, after the temptation. News about him spread throughout the whole countryside. Matthew 6, 4, that your charitable deed may be done in secret or it may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret himself will reward you openly. You know what happens to a man who will fight private battles because he wants God's will in his life? There comes something called anointing. It's a supernatural dimension of grace, literally, and effectiveness 2 Samuel 3, 19, Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. Peter on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? That is what you want, gentlemen. 
When you witness, let it not be blah, 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 blah. You want something that you say to penetrate. You want when you stand to street preach that there be something that God grabs them. That when you pull an altar call, there be something impacting them. But all that comes out of private battles. 2 Samuel 5 shows the result of men connecting with a man of God. They, these mighty men, they helped David enter his destiny. 2 Samuel 5, 3. Then all the elders came to the king at Hebron, made a covenant with them, and they anointed David king over Israel. You want God to use your life, you need to say, I want to help my pastor fulfill God's will in his life. Number two, they established God's will in a physical location. Jerusalem was won by conquest. They fought for it. That's what a disciple should do. You are helping your pastor establish the will of God in a physical location, in a city. They helped other people that were threatened by the enemy. Various enemies you read about that they fought. They were helping people. That's what a man of God does. And fourthly, then they entered their own destiny. First Chronicles 11.10. These were the heads of the mighty men whom David had who strengthened themselves with him and his kingdom with all Israel to make him king according to the word of the Lord concerning Israel. If you will connect yourself to God's purpose through a man of God, there'll come a day when God will bring you into your destiny. And then the cycle will now repeat. You will be the captain who will help men be transformed and enter into their destiny. David Livingston, he graduated from university with a degree in medicine. He could have been a doctor. He could have been anything you want. A very smart man. But God called him to the mission field in Central Africa where the gospel had not been preached. And David Livingston went to Africa. He sacrificed. He spent years separated from his family. His wife joined him in Africa and she died there. After 16 years of laboring in Africa, he went back to Scotland and they asked him to speak to the students at the university. Many of the students, they heard this man who had been in Africa, they came to heckle. They were going to mock him until they saw him. They said by this time his left arm hung uselessly because he had been attacked by a lion. He, he was thin and emaciated, weak from various diseases, half deaf because of rheumatic fever, half blind from an eye injury. By that time, he had already walked 11,000 miles across Africa. He was paving the way for the gospel to be preached. And those students, when they saw that was a man, instead of mocking, they stood to their feet in honor and listened to every word that he said. Some of those students who came to mock that day they wound up becoming missionaries in Africa and joining him there. David Livingston died on his knees praying in Africa before they sent his body home for burial. They, you know, they removed his heart and buried it in Africa because they said that's where his heart is. And David Livingston went to Africa. It was said that there were no Christians. None. By the time he died, they estimate there were a few thousand Christians. Today, they estimate in that area where he labored, there are now 300 million Christians. David Livingston was a mighty man who connected himself to the purposes of God. Gentlemen, there are mighty men here. 
And if you would catch a vision for God's plan for your life, all the impact that other people will feel because of your life. Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes all across this place. Thank God with every head bowed now. I want to speak, first of all, there are men here, you are not right with God. You're living in sin, playing games with God. Sin cuts you off from God. Sin is completely unsatisfying. You live as a rebel against God. It does not satisfy. All it does is ruin and destroy. You need to deal with a sin problem. And only Jesus Christ is the answer for your sin. He died on the cross. And what you need to do is repent. If you will be honest with God and pray, God could forgive you and transform you from the inside out. I'm asking right now, how many of you here, you need Jesus. You're not right with God and you know that. While our heads are bowed, I want you to do one thing. If you want to pray tonight and surrender to God, I want you to lift up your hand. How many would there be? Pastor Greg, I need Jesus. Thank you. I see that hand. How many others? Others lifting your hand on the side. Thank you. God bless you. Lift it up high. Thank you. Men are responding. God bless you. Thank you. In the middle here. God bless you. How many others? I need Jesus. I'm not right with God. Hold your hand up. I want to pray. Hands are going up. Thank you. Some of you are backslidden. You were saved. But you turned your back on God. Backslider, lift up your hand. I want to get right. God bless you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you at the front. God bless these that are being honest. How many others? You need Jesus. Lift up your hand right now. Let God help you. Thank God. God's dealing with you. Only God can heal your sin problem. You cannot continue the way you're living. Why don't you surrender tonight? Anybody else? Quickly. Now, I want every man that lifted your hand, stand up to your feet right now. Don't wait. Do it right now. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Yes. Come here. Come here. Kneel down right here. I want a man to pray with every one of these men. Pray a sinner's prayer before anything else. They want to get right with God. Kneel down at the front. Let God help you. Let God help you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Every one of these that are coming, find a place to pray. Kneel down all across the front. God can save you. He can help you. Thank God. Make sure every single man has someone praying with them. God bless you. Thank you. Thank God. I want the rest of the men to stand up. I gave you a challenge about becoming mighty. Come before God. Some of you need to settle this issue. God, I'm going I'm to quit running. I, I want your will. Some of you don't know. Then come and ask God. Give me a vision of your will for my life. You're going to sing while people are coming right now. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. And renew a right spirit within, within me. me. And create in me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Oh, Jesus, help us tonight, Lord God. And cast me Raise up men to your will, Lord God. Oh, God, I'm grateful for your goodness. Hallelujah, Lord God, I believe you, Lord God. Restore. The joy of thy salvation and renew a right spirit oh, within me. God, salabakare be 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 under the barre be key and create in me a 
And I want you to bow your heads right now. With our heads bowed, I gave a challenge about becoming a mighty man, about God's plan for your life, God's will for your life. While I was preaching, I'm confident that God was speaking to men. I don't know what your plans are for your life, but God has been speaking tonight that some of you, he wants you to preach the gospel people that he has ordained to be saved, cities he's ordained for you to impact nations. While our heads are bowed, I'm asking very first of all, there's some of you, you have never settled this issue, you've never responded to the call of God before, but some of you, while I was preaching, God was putting his finger on your heart and you want to go on record and say, I have heard the voice of God. I believe that God wants me to preach the gospel. You don't have to worry about when, how, where. What you need to do, first of all, is say yes. How many of you have never responded to the call of God and tonight you lift up your hand and say, I'm responding, I'm going on record. Yes, 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 thank God, yes, yes. Thank God for these. There are other men in the past God has put his hand on you. You've said yes, but then you... Various things that I preach, you won't receive a captain, you won't draw near, you get distracted, but God has reminded you of what you are to be, and you also want to go on record, you want to say, I am responding to God's purpose, His will, and the call of God in my life. If that's you, lift up your hand, say, that's me, yes, I want God's will, I want God's will. I'm going to pray for you right now, oh God, there are men here the potential that you have. Oh, my Father, touch them. God, let it be more than words. I am asking that you'd cause a fire to burn on the inside. Give them a passion for your will. Cause them to hunger to do right, to make impact for you in the earth. God, I thank you that from this company there are going to be mighty men God, let them make decisions when they leave this place that will be pleasing in your sight and will bring about the will of God. And I thank you in advance for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. We thank you for it. Amen. Let's praise God together right now. Oh, God. (coughs) Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, I'm grateful for your goodness, Lord. God, I'm grateful for the power of the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. You can